Put, Michael Watson has done a complete costume change. I have not space only clothes, now. <laughs> clothes, but his background because he is the star. It's now Michael's turn. Oh, and he has, oh look at this. The angle is just right. It never occurred to me. This <laughs> <laughs> You're haloed now. That is that's a whole nother presentation. <laughs> the whole time you spent in the in the religious world has kind of paid off for you, apparently. Yeah, well the batteries haven't worn out yet. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. That's very nice, Michael. Um, so tell us a little bit about, I mean, you've already alluded, Michael, to the fact that you started out in the priesthood and you were doing a different sort of hypnosis then. Yeah. I mean, it's all, it's definitely hypnosis. Yeah. You just did that after the fact. Yes, Adam Lambert was in the choir with me. <laughs> I'll bet he was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he was. At least you went to the same church. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true. So, uh, uh, so yeah, what was it, what was the question behind all that? Yeah. So how did you get into it? I mean, we, you started in the priesthood, but how did you make that transition to a formal hypnosis? It was the weirdest thing. Hypnosis was just completely outside of my box. I had no, you know, I, I mean, I had nothing against it. I just didn't know anything about it. The only thing I knew was uh, every once in a while, I saw somebody do some strange thing on television or in the movies or something. In fact, what, what, oh, I know what, what, what really inspired me was uh, the first, this is really my first film reference to hypnosis, was um, uh, I was a teenage werewolf, which was, uh, 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 what's, what's his name, uh, Michael Landon, before his hair yeah, got. Yeah, 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 Little Joe. <laughs> yeah, before, before he was even Little Joe yet. He was Tiny Joe then. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and Tiny Joe was a teenage werewolf. And, um, and Lloyd Nolan, I think it was, um, my memory could be wrong, it could be somebody that just looked kind of like him, but played the, the doctor <coughs> who was experimenting with hypnosis. And he, uh, he actually did narco-hypnosis. He, uh, he gave Michael Landon a shot, an injection. And right behind the injection, then the, the camera closed in on Michael Landon's face and his eyes started to spin around and I mean, with little spirals in them and do all kinds of weird things. And, Lloyd, Lloyd Nolan grabbed hold of him and shook him and he said, where are you and what are you doing? And I thought, this is the kind of profession I would really like to be in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that was really all I knew was that weird stuff like that. And, and, uh, and the three faces of Eve, I remember that as well. I thought that was really quite impressive. And of course, you just switch from one personality to another, like changing channels by saying, now I'd like to talk to Eve Black. And, uh, you know, and the other one pops out. <laughs> really sort of naive things, <clears throat> pardon me, but I don't think I was different than anybody else in terms of this is what we got. Oh, uh, Route 1, I, <laughs> we were right at the end of the road to Key West. Yeah, so, um, so anyway, that's, uh, uh, that was my first exposure to it. And, and what, really, what really happened is I was having in, in church, in my religious experiences, I was having some real mystical experiences to, to try to put a, a, a word on it. I had a, a, a tremendous sense of, you know, I'm not a, I, I'm, I'm a high church Anglican. So, you know, it was about liturgy and, and, uh, and, and uh, mystery and transformation. It wasn't about preaching. It wasn't about anything else. Uh, it was literally about the, the creation and immersion in this uh, spiritual exercise, a spiritual state. Uh, on a regular on a regular basis, uh, that's what I knew about altered states of consciousness. So so as it is, I end up uh, you know I end up going through the going through the the procedures, the channels, and the church, and getting to seminary and getting ordained. And finally, though, I went to a Benedictine monastery for two and a half years. So I'm chanting, and uh, you know, life is an extended meditation. And when I came out of the monastery, <laughs> I love the double entendre. <laughs> <laughs> but when I came out of the monastery, um, the bishop gave me a job working in the Diocese of Chicago for the Diocesan Counseling Center. And I was doing pastoral counseling in the late 70s during a period of time when what was really current in counseling psychology were all of these radical new approaches that had to do with guided imagery and creative visualization and people like Gene Houston were starting to be heard of in the world and 
you know, uh, and all of that stuff was going on. So, so I'm doing these processes with clients. And one day somebody said to me, well, you know, Michael, this is really hypnosis. And I remember that it was the weirdest thing that, because it, it, it so had not occurred to me uh, that there was a relationship. And I'm like, oh my God, there actually is this professional field that involves, uh, uh, you know, the utilization of altered states of consciousness <clears throat> that I had an undergraduate background um, in linguistics, uh, just incidentally, which, which <laughs> really was uh, a godsend in this. Um, and so I, uh, I took off. I had to, you know, I had to learn about this. And, and, uh, and my husband and I were living in Chicago at the time and uh, things were changing and uh, 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 it was kind of time to leave Chicago. And, and uh, so we were looking at other options and uh, he's originally from Houston. And he came across this uh, advertisement. We saw a thing about a, a hypnosis certification course that was being taught in Houston. And, and I was so, here's how naive I was. I thought there's probably four people in the universe that actually teach hypnosis. So, and I found out about one of them and, you know, and she's in Houston and we could go there. So I went there only to take this course that was just 30 hours long. I mean, it, it, in hindsight, it's ridiculous. It was just 30 <laughs> hours long, uh, 10 Wednesday nights. I mean, it was a good course, right? Uh, certainly not what I would consider to be a, a you know, a complete training in hypnosis. Um, but it really got everything started. And she was, uh, she was rather transpersonal uh, and uh, esoteric uh, and uh, a very interesting lady. I realized when I came out of her training that I knew how to, I was good at inductions, but I already knew that. In fact, I already had that sense from the meditative work and facilitated meditation that I was, you know, that I was doing. So I, I just didn't really have the sense that I had a full toolbox in terms of how to deal with the various issues that clients bring to therapy. But the weirdest coincidence, um, if such things as coincidences exist, <laughs> is that uh, this lady was enrolled in a really early NLP practitioner training, the lady that was teaching us hypnosis. And she started telling us something about neurolinguistic programming. <clears throat> and I was so intrigued that uh, the next thing I know, uh, I had uh, moved to Colorado to study with the Andreases and their training organization and, and learned NLP. Uh, at the end of that, I, I, I left there because Robert Diltz had come in and done some works on, on belief and health at a training that I was in, an advanced training that I was in. This is why earlier, by the way, I was so interested in education and the idea that, you know, you just keep, you just keep going, uh, seems to me to, to, to me to be the case. So, so now it's about beliefs and health and let's get that special training. And where was that going to be other than Santa Cruz, California, the birthplace of neurolinguistic programming. So I went there and I did that and I moved to San Francisco. And in this period of time, <clears throat> back at the birthplace of NLP, I made contact with Stephen Gilligan, who was the protege of Milton Erickson's uh, and the greatest hypnotist that, uh, that I've ever known in terms of the kind of therapeutic work that I do. Um, and, uh, and he became my, uh, you know, my real teacher, I guess, my ultimate teacher, uh, I would say with regard to that. So one thing leads to another, the long and winding road. Um, and so for me, hypnosis has a little more of a, um, a, a little more of a mystical sense to it, a little more of a, of a, uh, I shouldn't say more of because I don't know more than who or, uh, or what, but, but, uh, but I know for me the particular flavor that I favor, if you will, um, is maybe a little quieter, a little gentler, <clears throat> and in many cases really focused on things like personal expansion and evolution and stuff, um, as opposed to I don't do as much stop smoking and weight loss uh, work as other people do. I end up doing a lot of anxiety, um, anxiety work, uh, and uh, and I get referrals from local therapists, which is a really useful thing, <coughs> and and have sort of promoted through all of this um, this idea that I'm really fond of called evolutionary hypnosis, and that's kind of the thing that I that I do now. Uh, the understanding of evolutionary hypnosis being simply that we are all creatures in evolution. Evolution is happening through us. Period. You know, and sometimes that goes well, and sometimes that needs a little bit of facilitation. But, uh, 
but we're in the process of waking up. We're in the process of emerging. And those things that look like symptoms are really often opportunities where something new is trying to come forward in a person's life and they haven't yet figured out how to integrate it or how to move into that, into that transition successfully. Uh, so uh, I just think it's, it's such a privilege that we have to be a part of that process, that people sort of show up and they say, I'm, I'm growing, <laughs> you know, um, uh, water me, <laughs> you know, uh, um, because our job really is to support and to nurture that, that, that transition, um, to educate it, to sophisticate it, to, you know, to help them make it work out in the world. So this is all very interesting, stuff that I'd love to talk about, but I, but I do want to make sure that I get to, uh, to share the Tibetan star with you. So, and I was just going to interrupt and say we've got about 15 minutes. Can we do it in 15 yeah, minutes? Yeah, oh yeah, we can do it in 15 minutes. Uh, you know, what is time after all? It's just uh, <laughs> moving the planets around it, something. I, I don't know what it really has to do with. Uh, but I'm sure that we can. Uh, as a matter of fact, the movement of planets is a, nice, uh, is a nice way to open up the discussion. The Tibetan star is something that I'm especially fond of because uh, it became a regular annual thing for me, January 6th being the epiphany. Uh, I had a regular event every year, a 12th night, uh, a 12th night program, <clears throat> and I like the idea of being able to incorporate it into it a guided meditative process. Uh, that has to do with sort of paving the way for the new year um, and that ties into those uh, Twelfth Night traditions. And uh, Twelfth Night centers around the, the wise men and the thing, of course, that the wise men of Bethlehem, of, uh, well, of wherever they were from, the wise men from Persia, uh, is, the, uh, is the image of the star that's associated with Christmas. So the final night of, uh, the final night of Christmas is the perfect time to be celebrating this and we're we're just right there within two days of it. And, uh, and in order to start out, what I'd like everybody to consider while I'm uh, giving you this little bit of background is that, um, do you have a dream? You know, do you have something that you really want to manifest in your life and that you're really ready to have manifest in your life? <clears throat> because I really have this kind of confidence about this particular process. I think that if you will follow the process here with me tonight, and just follow those simple little instructions that I'm going to give you at the end in terms of what to do with it, that, uh, that these things that you really want to see change in your life can and, and will change for you. <laughs> so it's important that you have a dream, <coughs> pardon me, and I also want you to understand where this all comes from. Uh, it comes from the Shuar, who were the last indigenous people uh, discovered, um, uh, a guy named John Perkins, who at the age of, uh, or in the 1960s, I think around about 1963, as a young man went with the, uh, uh, with the Peace Corps into the Amazon uh, rainforest, and they stumbled across the Shuar, who uh, a generation ago had been headhunters. I mean, these are like scary tribal people. And, uh, and they took a liking to John. I think they wanted to fatten him up for the next holiday feast. I'm not quite sure what the deal was. But, they, but they, they took a liking to him and they shared some things with him and ultimately encouraged him to, uh, to bring some people uh, to see them and to see their ways. Uh, small people, not big ecotourism. He just wanted, they just really wanted him to bring folks that were going to be responsible about uh, helping to educate the world about the rainforest and things like that. So just some wonderful stuff behind it. Uh, the Shuar have an expression. They say the world is as you dream it. And actually the, the name of this exercise that I call the Tibetan star is more properly known as just an exercise for changing the dream. So to begin, um, it's important that you have something, you know, that you really want. And uh, just to let you know, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to generate three images that represent the essence uh, of this dream that you have for yourself. <clears throat> so to give you an example of how it worked for me, when I first did the exercise, um, I just had moved to Florida. I wanted to get a bunch of clients. So I had uh, uh, one, one goal was... Uh, more clients. Another goal was students. Uh, and another goal was uh, a boatload of money. Uh, you know, like most people. So, so, so here's what I wanted. More clients, more students, and more money. 
So, so you need an image to represent each of these things. So for me, I do most of my banking through an ATM machine. So the more money thing was represented by, back in those days, you know, you had to put your money in an envelope before you could stick it into the ATM. You know, now you can just put bills in most ATMs. So I had an envelope that was so thick that I couldn't quite, you know, get it. I had to really work to get it in the ATM machine. That was a, just a picture in my mind. I thought, that's perfect. That's what I'll use. So if you've got some kind of a dream, something you're thinking about, just get some picture. Fine, let something come into your mind uh, that can serve to represent one aspect of that dream. Another aspect of my dream was more students, and what I saw in my mind was a, a room full of students, and it's something that I see quite regularly now, doing more and more training all the time, and you know, like that. So, uh, uh, so a room basically standing in the front of the room and seeing seeing people, and. The, the more clients thing, and I will warn people about this, maybe your computer won't let you have the problem that I had because this is also back in a time when I didn't use my computer to keep my calendar. I had a day timer. And, and I saw this picture of a day timer and all of the spaces in it were filled. Don't do that. <laughs> you know, make sure when you're putting your images together that they really are things that you really want because we're talking about actually manifesting this. Okay. All right, so, uh, so it should only take us a few minutes to actually move through the, the process. We should, be, we should be fine with this. Um, and uh, there will be a part A and a part B. Uh, at the end of the first part, I will let you know that we've finished the first part because then you can practice it on your own in the future, starting at that midpoint. The first part will already have been done for you. You will you know, you do that here. So just take a moment and let yourself get comfortable and relax. And imagine that you're standing outside underneath the, the night sky, looking out across a wide open plain. Again, I mentioned the, the wise men and their travels. You might think about that, following a star that as you look up in the sky, 45 degrees up above the horizon, off in the distance, there's one particularly bright, shining, radiant star that you can look to for guidance, that leads you on your way. Now, I know that there's something that you really want to experience, something that you really want to create for yourself. So in your mind, just take a moment to allow an image to emerge that represents one aspect of that dream that you have, that dream that you want to bring into manifestation. And when you have that image in your mind, just imagine that you can then send that image out through your third eye, out into the night sky, all the way out to that star where it can be grabbed up into the star. You might see the star swell for a moment. It may brighten up just a little bit for a moment as it receives the image that you sent into it. And the image just integrates into the star. And after a moment or so, you just look and you just see once again that bright, shining, radiant star. But you know something about it. You know that it contains that particular thing that you've chosen to place there. And yet there's more to your dream than that. So take another moment now to allow a second image to come into your mind that represents another aspect of this dream that you really intend to manifest. And when that image comes into your mind, then just as you did before, just send it out through your third eye, out across the night sky, where it can be received through that star. Again, you might see the star flare just for a second, and then settle back to its usual brightness, brilliance. <coughs> and you know that that image is contained within that star as well. That star that's out there 45 degrees above the horizon, that star that's out there to lead you through the wilderness onto your destiny. 
And I suspect that there's even a third image that wants to come forward within you that represents yet another aspect of this dream that you'd like to manifest. So go ahead then and take that image and send it out through your third eye, out into the night sky. Let it be received by that star. And watch it shine brightly across the night sky. <coughs> and this is the end of the first part of the process. And any time you want to practice this on your own, you can begin at this part right here, at this point right here. You have the star. It's there up above the horizon, 45 degrees above the horizon in the night sky. And it contains within it those images that you've placed there. So just relax and see it now up there in the sky. And this time what I'd like you to do is to imagine that you can draw that star down out of the night sky through your third eye into the center of your head. <clears throat> and however you think about that, as you look around inside the center of your head, you see that crystalline brightness. And somehow in there are those one, two, three images that you've chosen to place inside. And now with the intention of releasing the energy that's contained within that star, that's contained within those images, just like the Big Bang at the beginning of creation, allow that star in the center of your head to explode now. <sighs> Feel it being released into your consciousness, being released into your awareness, being released into your mind. And after a moment or so, the cosmic dust settles and there in the center of your head, once again, is that bright, shining, radiant star. And so for a second time, releasing his energy into your consciousness, into your awareness, allow that star to explode for a second time now. And feel and sense it being received into your psyche, into your understanding, into the, your very being. And then after a moment or so, the dust settles in there once again. That bright, shining, radiant star. And so for a third time, just to make sure, allow that star in the center of your head to explode now. Filling your consciousness, infusing your awareness. That's right. And after a moment, the dust settles and there in the center of your head is that bright, shining radiance. And now you can allow that star in the center of your head to drop down now into your heart center. And in the same way, so as to release it not only into your thinking and into your consciousness and into your awareness, but into your life, into your living, into your being. Allow that star in your heart center to explode now. And after a moment, it settles down. There, that radiance right there in your heart center, containing that dream that's coming into expression through you. Allow it to explode for a second time there in your heart center now, becoming a part of your life, a part of your being. <sighs> and then let the dust settle. Becoming more and more charged with the dream.
your life infused with this stream, your thoughts, your consciousness, your awareness, focused on the dream that you will manifest there in your heart center now for a third and final time. Allow that radiant star to explode now, becoming one with you. And then after a moment, the dust settles once again. There in your heart center is that radiance, that brightness. Just allow it to move on up into the center of your head now, where it was once before. And let it exit through your third eye and to find its way out into the night sky, 45 degrees or so above the horizon off in the distance. Where it can continue to be for you, to lead you, to guide you. And any time you want to, you can draw it back down into your, into your head and explode it there in the center of your head three times. And draw it down into your heart center. Release its energy there into your heart center three times. And then again, bring it back up, back out, and just put it back in the night sky. My pledge to you is that if you will practice this technique three times or so a week, it will be more than enough to begin to raise the vibrations that you need to create this outpicturing. So I would encourage you to do that. Um, now this was meditation, this wasn't hypnosis, so you're not in a trance, so you don't need for me to count for you to come back to the room. But you could come back to the room on your own in a nice, quiet, easy way, whenever it is that you're ready and it makes sense for you to do so. I have uh, run a couple of minutes, oh, just a couple of minutes over, um, but I, uh, I think we managed to pull that on time pretty well. So thanks, everybody. I, uh, I really love doing that. Are you back, Karen? Lovely. <laughs> Good. As always. All right. Well. So I, just wanna, I just wanna read a couple of the comments and, and then, uh, we're moving along to uh, Shelley Stockwell, Nicholas, although I want to find out how we, how we can get in touch with Michael, but let me just read some of these con comments to you. Deborah Yaffe would like to know, would you please name the group that this comes from? Okay. Well, it isn't any particular group. There's a man named John Perkins who went with the Schwar, with, with the Peace Corps uh, to the Amazon where he, where he met these, it, you know, the, the Schwar is the name of the tribe, S-H-U-A-R. Um, that, uh, that this comes from if that's what you were looking for. Yeah, that's, that seemed to satisfy her. Okay. Uh, and, and comments now, beautiful Michael, weeping, laughing, receptive, deserving. Lovely. Another, it felt like fireworks on the 4th of July, wondering why you call it Tibetan star. Love the it. Earth moved. Uh, so the reason I call it the Tibetan star is that according to John Perkins, the shamans of the Shuar in the Amazon, and go figure, I don't understand this. It doesn't make any more sense to me. It didn't make any sense to John. Uh, they told him that they had learned it from some Tibetan shamans. Uh-oh. Um, so uh, they Somehow were we just in the Andes. Okay. How, the, uh, who, how this happened is, who knows? <laughs> but, you dropped uh, out there for just a moment. Yeah, I saw that. So, but anyway, how that name got there is, is nobody's really clear about it other than, like I said, the Shuar say they learned it from some shamans from Tibet. Maybe they had some visitors or something. And uh, so... So I've called it the Tibetan star uh, because I love the ambiguity. <laughs> and Joe Moon says it was great. Michael will do. I think like you, Joe, if you were uh, talking about doing it three times a week, I think I will too. I think it was just lovely. Yeah. And that was bleeping beautiful. Lovely. How do we get in touch with you? Oh, well, uh, you can, anybody can write me any old time at F. Oh, so just like Jason said, he's in Virginia uh, and does hypnosis. Uh, I'm in Florida and I do hypnosis. So my email address is flhypno, F-L like Florida, hypno at outlook.com. Uh, I certainly am responsive to that. I've got a bunch of exciting stuff going on, by the way. I have a core transformation uh, training coming up here in Orlando in February on the uh, 
darn it, I don't know. It's the second, the second uh, Saturday in February. <laughs> uh, I think it's something like the twelfth uh, or uh, something like that. Second weekend in February. Um, and uh, and then uh, well, and before that, by the way, I'm on the way to Brazil, which will be quite exciting to a uh, hypnosis conference there. And then after core transformation out there, I'm going to be heading out Shelley Stockwell's way uh, for uh, her convention, and uh, I'm going to be doing core transformation as a two-day uh, post-conference program out there as well. So uh, uh, so. All those exciting things. If you want to know about any of that stuff, flhypno at outlook.com would be the best way to get a hold of me. And the first time I ever encountered Michael was on a, an IACT, one of these virtual chapter meetings, and he didn't know me. I didn't know him. I emailed him just as he suggested to do it. He emailed me back immediately, so he's very good about that. I didn't know her from Adam Lambert. <laughs> But now he knows me in conjunction with, so. <laughs> in conjunction with. <laughs> Michael, that was beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I